What's up, everyone? I'm Alex Lieberman, co-founder and executive chairman of Morning Brew. Welcome to season four of Fresh Invest, the podcast where we explore all things investing, sponsored by Fidelity Investments and powered by Morning Brew. This time around, we are exploring strategies and tips to help you invest wisely wherever you are in life. With help from our friends at Fidelity, we'll dive into the investing life cycle in the context of today's market landscape, emerging trends, and long-term wealth building strategies. Let's get into it. Last week, we broke down ways to live off your investment earnings. We covered calculating how much you'll need to save to retire comfortably, how to manage passive income, and more. This week, we're changing gears to talk about one of the buzziest topics out there, generative AI. Those two words can bring up all kinds of feelings. It can be intriguing, concerning, and exciting at the same time. And for investors, they spark a lot of questions about how this technology will impact portfolios. Today, we'll take a look at AI from a business and economic perspective with Lubna Lundy, Director of Investment Product at Fidelity. We'll discuss opportunities that might be born out of the AI boom and how investors can evaluate them. Then next week, we'll continue the AI conversation and focus on how it's impacting the investing experience and how you can leverage AI-enabled tools in your investing journey. Lubna, welcome back. Yes, thank you. I'm You're here, to be season here. three, back yes. for season four, and back in the flash last time yes. it was over Zoom. Yes. I love well, it. well, before we hop into the conversation, uh, can you just introduce yourself for the crowd? Yeah, sure. So I am Lubna Lundy. I'm a director of investment product at Fidelity. Um, I work in our asset management and um, division uh, in the investment product group. And I cover thematic investing strategies. So I get to work with our investment teams. Uh, so the portfolio managers, the research analysts, also data scientists, quants, a number of people to keep a pulse on what the emerging themes are, what themes may be moving out of favor, all with the goal to create investment products uh, for investors to invest in the future through thematic investing. And I'm also very active on social media, so follow me if you Ooh, can. Love uh, it. Love the plug. Yeah, <laughs> I, I post a lot of behind-the-scenes uh, industry content, fun videos, and also thought leadership from a lot of our great research experts. And we've been posting a lot about AI and disruption and ETFs, and so I'm really happy to have this conversation. Perfect. Well, we're going to be talking about AI today, so if you like what you hear, make sure to uh, check out um, what Lubna and her team are creating on social. So let's talk about, we're going to start high level and then get more micro. Let's talk about the economic impact of AI. Um, there's a lot of different estimates out there, but I saw basically that from Goldman Sachs's perspective, they estimate a 7% increase in GDP, meaning, you know, trillions of dollars of added value to GDP. For investors who are trying to think about from like a wealth building and macroeconomic perspective, how should they think about this tectonic shift that is happening with AI? What would you say? Uh, let's jump right <laughs> into it, Alex. Thank you for that easy start. Layups, question. that's what we're about, layups. <laughs> yes, there have been a ton of estimates published. Um, one I saw recently was from McKinsey. They actually estimated or anticipate that AI could add between two to four trillion to the global economy. And just for context, the GDP of the UK is a little over three tri trillion. So a Wild. huge potential impact, but it's still really early. So we usually shy away from these big estimates. Uh, but it does feel like we've seen this movie before. Um, people have heard this comparison between AI, generative AI, um, having this iPhone moment. Yep. A lot of people did not anticipate the trillion dollar economy that the iPhone would drive. And now with breakthroughs with large language models and generative AI, you know, the thinking is it could also drive a significant economy. And we've seen this with a lot of tech revolutions from PCs, internet, mobile tech, cloud computing, now AI. They all present these huge opportunities and also challenges across many industries with corresponding winners and losers across many asset types. Um, we believe the, the key is managing the shifting risks and identifying profitable opportunities across companies and sectors. Um, with new tech, there's always the fear of the unknown. Could AI write podcasts in the future? I don't know. I'd love to see how they come <laughs> up with a podcast for this. But with emerging technology, it you know there's also 
the chance and opportunity to drive new jobs. Yep. And that's really important for long term economic growth. So as you're evaluating, you know, different long term diversified wealth building strategies, that's going to be really important to consider. Totally. Well, we're going to talk in a few minutes about the impact of AI on jobs. But I think overall, like this is such a profound technology theme to to talk about and think about because it really impacts every part of the economy. It really does. And so let's talk about how AI will increase productivity within the workplace, as you alluded to. How do shifts in what's going to happen in the workplace as a function of AI, how is that going to impact how investors should be thinking about their portfolio? Yeah, it, what's funny is a lot of investors don't realize AI is already starting to impact investment portfolios. In funny, what sense? Funny story. Uh, so I started an asset management investment product, and I set up time with all of the investment teams, folks. I knew I was going to have to work closely with portfolio managers, research analysts, and I was asked to then set up time with quants, data scientists, <laughs> people yep. in our then artificial intelligence or AI center of excellence. And I was kind of scratching my head because I was like, I, I didn't have an appreciation or an awareness of how much AI would impact the investment product development right. process for certain strategies. And so six ETF launches later, now it makes a ton of sense. We use natural language processing, or NLP for short. It's a subset of AI, and it allows big asset management firms like Fidelity. It allows us to um, use text-based documents for companies to identify companies that may align with themes and strategies. Mm -hmm. um, so really a way to more efficiently create investment products so you have more investment management firms that are using NLP for product development. And when you think about it, so much of investing is how do you capitalize on data and information yep. in addition to macro or market inefficiencies. And so with AI, we're starting to see how you can do that more. I don't know. Do you know? Have you heard of the Fidelity Center of Applied Technology? I have not. So they're called FCAP for short. They're like our in-house innovation lab. They track emerging technology trends and they have an AI incubator and they built using generative AI, an advisor assistant tool mm. to just test out how it could potentially impact how advisors manage client portfolios and, and client data. And they actually demoed it to a set of clients during a Fidelity Institutional Conference, which was really cool. So now are, is every firm and sector starting to apply, you know, AI to increase productivity at the point at this point right now? No. So as investors, it's going to be really important for them to understand, you know, what are the companies that are adopting AI? What are the sectors that that are adopting it? It's going to, you know, the adoption curve is going to be different across different sectors. If you're passionate about AI and technology, I'm sure you're, you know, watching how it evolves yep. over time. And that's going to be helpful in managing your portfolio. Totally. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it is like with any large technological change, there's going to be a lot of noise inherently because mm -hmm. anytime there's a big tectonic shift and especially a lot of money from just like the, the private investing community going yeah. into a space, there are going to be some people who are in it for short-term gains. But I do think there's really interesting things happening. At least my perspective is I'm trying a lot of different things to see what is actually game changing for me. Mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned that, you know, the tool that Fidelity has worked on to uh, assist financial advisors because, you know, a friend of mine is working on uh, a uh, basically an, an automated app that let's say someone wants to go on vacation a year from now and they put in a budget for that vacation. The idea would be that not only is an itinerary created for them, but actually an automated amount of money is taken out of their paycheck to be put in a vacation fund every month. So I think it's really interesting, interesting in the sense of where long-term memory of an individual's personal preferences and data can be used to help drive actions in the future. Absolutely. I want to talk now more about the labor market because we talked about how AI can be um, a huge boost to productivity acting mm -hmm. as kind of an assistant uh, to professionals. But I think mm -hmm. kind of with any technological wave, people worry about, is this going to be the end of my job? Like you <laughs> were joking about the podcast, but honestly, one day <laughs> you may not need me here. And so AI, you know, is for sure projected to have a significant impact on the labor market. Um, like you said, it's going to create jobs, but there's also going to be jobs that 
unfortunately are either partially or entirely removed from this technology. There's a whole conversation that can be had around yeah. that. <laughs> but from an investor's perspective, yeah. how should an investor be thinking about what AI as a technology is going to do to the overall labor market? Yeah, and I know we went macro initially. Um, yeah. And I love plugging our research experts at Fidelity. Um, we do have, when we think about it from like a macro lens, we have an asset allocation research team and they cover macroeconomic trends. They publish thought leadership paper for our clients to leverage to help manage their portfolios. And one of the recent papers, they talked about this shifting dynamics between profits and productivity. Um, historically for companies as profits grew, so, so did productivity. Mm -hmm. But over the last decade or two, productivity has slowed down, more specifically labor productivity in the world and in the U.S. And so there's been this divergence between profits and productivity over the last two decades. But they believe with AI, with automation, just overall technological innovation, there's going to be a potentially a boost to um, productivity in the future that we could look for. So absolutely, yes, there are going to be shifts as, as it relates to jobs. Most jobs, many jobs are partially exposed to automation in some form or fashion. Yep. Um, I talked about McKinsey. Uh, I'll bring them up again. They have a, they projected that um, the that automation could potentially impact um, employees. It, it could, the work activity that consumes 60 to 70% of employees' time can be replaced with automation, which is very significant. Totally. <laughs> so, but I'm a glass half full kind of person. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward I to, that as exciting <laughs> to more productivity, yeah, totally. um, more efficiency, the potential to um, remove potential risks yep. in current processes. I'm also looking forward to, you talked about your friend's tool. I'm looking forward to some of these other tools, these AI assistant tools that are in the process of launching or may have already launched that boast capabilities from like, like taking ideas and creating a PowerPoint presentation yep. uh, based off those ideas or summarizing key points from a video call after you hang up. I, I work remote like I talked to you about and I, I would think love it's that. awesome. I would love that. Totally. Um, summarizing Excel data. So a lot of different things for us to look forward to. Going back to the investment aspect, it's going to be important for investors to uh, know what companies are prioritizing education and training for AI. They may be more resilient in the long run. They even may be better employers and better investment opportunities. When you think about it, a lot of investors are active members of the workforce totally. just like us. So, you know, there's a couple of different ways they can look at how AI is going to impact um, the labor force. But it's, it's really early, so we have to see how it plays out in the long run. Yeah, and I do think, you know, there's general consensus that when you look at large technological shifts, whether it was the internet, whether it was the mobile phone, they ended up being, you know, kind of when you look back in history, uh, they ended up being net positives for mm -hmm. the economy yeah. and for the labor force. And I even think about it as an entrepreneur, something that AI is going to do is it's going to make it even easier than it already is to go from having an idea for a business to launching a business. Like you were talking about a few tools and a few examples. One that I know exists now and I've tested out is the idea of putting in a little bit of information about your business, like your business's name, what you do, kind of your unique differentiators, and maybe like your logo and a few assets. And within 30 seconds, a full website is spun up for you. Ooh. And I think, you know, we, we've seen this proliferation of entrepreneurship and startups and small businesses in the US as a function of the internet, because the, the cost of starting a business is very different today than 15 years ago when you had to buy and rack your own server for mm -hmm. $50,000 to start a software company. And so I think, you know, bringing it back to glass half full, like a really exciting thing for people to think about is how maybe like there's going to even be more of a renaissance of new businesses to be found because yeah. the cost of failure, the cost of creating one is lower than ever. Isn't that I, amazing? I want to talk about kind of another phenomena that happens anytime there's a large technological shift. We saw this with uh, we know we saw this with crypto. We saw this during kind of like the GameStop and uh, like uh, Wall Street bets bonanza where anytime some large shift enters the zeitgeist. So I'd say, you know, the shift with the whole GameStop thing was like the rise of the retail investor. Uh, with crypto, it was this, you know, supposedly breakthrough innovation that was going to change society. AI is kind of 
another example of that. And anytime that happens, I think it creates a wedge uh, and an entry point for new people to get involved in mm -hmm. investing. I think that's really exciting because I think it forces hopefully a level of uh, thoughtfulness and knowledge around investing, which is important for all of us. Uh, but I think also it can be really daunting and I, yeah. and also it can lead to bad decisions if people don't do the right amount of preparation and research. So for people who are starting to get their feet wet in investing and specifically thinking about investing in AI, like what, what would you say to them? Well, I love analogies. Yep. So I love the picks and shovels analogy for the gold rush while not anyone, everyone wasn't guaranteed that they were going to find gold. Everyone had to have a pick and shovel to at least try, right? Yep. <laughs> so, um, and that's what made um, the picks and shovels uh, an attractive uh, investment opportunity. For the AI bloom, if you will, um, it's going to be important for investors to think about who are, what are, who are the, yeah, who are the enablers? Yeah. Who are, you know, what are the companies that are enabling AI? They're providing the hardware, the equipment, semi, semiconductor, um, just like NVIDIA. Um, also, what are the companies that have access to large data sets? When you talk about artificial intelligence, so much of it is data, having access to data. And even more important, what companies may have access to their own proprietary data sets? Because yep. that might be it or offer them a more competitive advantage as well. Um, at the same time, you also want to be aware of what companies may be at risk of being disrupted. Um, what companies may offer a service that could be commoditized, whether we're talking about like a a, a chat-based cu customer service yep. solution or um, freelance logo designs or you talk totally. about website building and yeah. just you know what you can build for different companies so you want to be aware of that but we also like to tell investors you don't have to become a stock picker you can you can leverage and rely on fidelity's global research team you have folks that are dedicated to identifying big themes like AI, identifying companies, um, disruptive companies that are driving the theme forward, and then also, you know, charting the progress over time. As an, indivi an individual investor, you know, you may not have the time to track a company up, up and down, um, especially newer companies that may not have yep. that much information available. And so... If you don't have the time, the will, or skill, you can absolutely leverage uh, research experts. You can also think about uh, investing in mutual funds or ETFs where you can invest in multiple companies and get exposure to themes like AI while also leveraging the expertise of our research professionals that will do the homework for you per se. So um, we like to, to stress those things. Um, would also say, would behoove investors to take a look at your current portfolio and see how much exposure to disruptive tech you already have. Um, because we like to remind folks, you know, disruptive tech, it can be volatile. And so you always want to think about how much risk you are willing to take on as you think about your investment exposure. Love it. There's, um, there's this concept that I read about recently and I, I can't stop thinking about it. It's, it's this idea of, uh, edge city. And the idea of edge city is that people who build really interesting companies or invest in really interesting things are people who live in edge city. And edge city is this idea mm -hmm. of spending your time psychologically on like kind of the edges of technology, meaning like you are learning about things that uh, people will be, the mainstream will be talking about three years from now. And so <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd be remiss to not ask you about just opportunities and trends within AI that could get me closer to edge city. No. And so, you know, you work in thematic investing. We spent last season, uh, most of our conversation talking about thematics and you specifically look at disruptive companies and technologies. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on trends or opportunities that you're seeing specifically within disruptive AI. Yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> as long as you need. <laughs> no, no. Um, no, but I'm loving how AI is manifesting itself in my daily life from all of my personal online purchases that AI tells me to buy yeah. <laughs> to, like I talked about, my professional um, life and with using or leveraging AI for um, investment product development. But when you think about it, AI has really become like table stakes for innovation and disruption. And so we do have disruptive ETF strategies that give you some exposure to AI, and they focus on disruption in five key areas that include medicine, 
technology, automation, communications, and finance. And like I said, AI shows up in some form or fashion in all of these strategies. Mm -hmm. And for example, uh, disruptive medicine, um, you may have heard of precision medicine. Yep. So we're now harnessing big data to come up with custom um, treatments for illnesses like cancer, uh, moving from this one size fits all approach or one size fits all, you know, uh, to totally. every treatment to now um, having more customized medical solutions because of AI and big data. And it makes so, so much sense. I feel like 20 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, wait, we, we treated doing? everyone the exact same way? <laughs> like, yeah. where do we do that in any other part of society? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so much, so many advances uh, being made. Um, that it's just amazing to see. Um, when we think about disruption in communications or AI related disruptions there, think about how often Netflix tells you what you want to watch. Yep. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're wrong, but a lot of times they, they're, Spot on, <laughs> I'll totally. be honest. They know, know what we like. But we know behind the scenes, that's really Netflix's algorithm curating the recommendations. Same thing with Amazon, yep. Yeah, and because I mentioned Netflix, I think we have to talk about digital infrastructure. Yep. Um, do you remember when it used to take hours to download a Netflix movie? Yes. And now you can do it in seconds. Yep. That's the difference between a, a 3G network and a 5G network. And so, you know, when it comes to AI, digital infrastructure is so critical. AI becomes more powerful with better digital infrastructure, cloud computing. A lot of companies are moving data to the cloud. Um, cloud computing is one of the fastest growing areas yep. in tech of technology, according to IDC. And, you know, with cloud computing and AI, there's this symbiotic relationship when it comes to automation and a lot of a lot more physical tasks are being automated. Um, so I, we can go on and on, but we're seeing lots of disruption from marketing, content creation, robotics, um, automation, of course. And Last time we chatted, we talked a little bit about alternative yep. food sources and crickets, right? Yes, we did. Yes, we <laughs> so, did. I still haven't eaten a cricket. <laughs> in addition to precision medicine, uh, precision agriculture, yep. that's a thing, you know, because of the issues with food scarcity, half, you know, the arable land that we have to farm on, that's, it's declined by 50% over the last couple of decades. So lots of ways we're seeing AI drive disruption. Totally. I think... Um, Again, it's it's super exciting for people to think about AI, think the po think about the possibility of AI, think about as an investor, how do they get exposure to AI if they are bullish on just the kind of the impact it will have broadly on society. But also, I think like any disruptive technology, it can be daunting. Yeah. Um, there's very like uh, clear risks and costs associated with just getting involved or investing in the space. So how would you kind of distinguish, let's call it like the green flags and the red flags of getting involved in disruptive technology or space like AI? Yeah, by by nature, disruptive themes, they challenge the status quo. They include companies that have, you know, different unique business models that are delivering new solutions in innovative ways. And so, yes, just investing in disruption, it may be more volatile. The companies may be inherently riskier. <laughs> And so you think about examples of disruption, too, from over the last decade or so. Can we could we fathom the, the idea that people would spend money or pay other people to stay at their house instead of staying at a hotel for vacation? Yeah. So in the same way that, you know, <laughs> having a stranger drive you. Exactly. Exactly. The same thing. Well. The same concept of yeah. car share uh, or ride share applications, but very different, unique models that ended up being successful. Totally. And so we like that. You know, what are the companies that are delivering solutions that are completely different? No one else is doing it, but better yet, they're driving revenue um, or uh, increasing the percentage of revenue growth for that overall company. We talked about it a little bit in the other question in terms of what potential yep. red flags. You want to make sure that that disruptive solution isn't easily uh, at risk of being disrupted because yep. that is a thing. But that's easier said than done. We also talked about investors don't have to be stock pickers. With our disruptive strategies, we have research experts that are identifying disruption, disruptive companies. They're assigning them disruptive scores. They're looking at the fundamentals. How is the management team? What does the balance sheet look like? Um, what's the company's strategic vision? They're factoring all of that into um, 
whether or not they include these companies in our disruptive strategies. And we talked about risk. They are monitoring monitoring risk over time. Um, they meet on a quarterly basis, identify new companies that we can add to the strategy, companies we may think about removing. And we also have a quant portfolio manager that has this ability to systematically adjust risk um, and manage manages the risk and volatility over time. So I keep stressing because I think I want investors to know that you have other ways that you can think about getting exposure right. outside of becoming a stock picker on your own. You can leverage Which strategies. is not realistic for most people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you, leverage active management, especially if you're looking for, uh, you know, if you're looking to get disruptive exposure in your portfolio. We started uh, macro, macro and I want to finish macro. I think, you know, one of the great things about, you know, reading biographies or uh, reading, um, you know, historical nonfiction is you can learn a lot of lessons that while not exact predictors of the future are pretty good at giving you certain models and ways of thinking about yeah. the world. So let's talk about AI right now, but in thinking about historically what's happened about with disruptive technology and, you know, specifically the advent of the internet and the dot-com bubble, is there anything we can learn from historical moments like that that you think will give investors a clearer picture for how to think about AI right now, as well as just overall it, the, the theme moving forward? Yeah, I think the dot-com bubble, there were some things that we could learn from, from that. And for folks that may not be aware of what that was, it was a time when there was, of course, this rapid rise in U.S. tech stock valuations that were fueled by investments in internet or dot-com-based companies. The NASDAQ went from like 1,000 to yep. 5,000 in a short amount of time. Um, but you had a lot of these startup dot-com companies that didn't really have track records of success. In some instances, companies were just slapping dot-com at the end of the company name in, in hopes of you know attracting investments. And so you did have companies that failed. But you also had winners that came out of totally. the dot-com bubble, winners like Amazon. Um, you know, Amazon, they started out as an online bookstore, mm -hmm. and they continued to focus on innovation and expansion. And, you know, they saw their stock price go from less than $10 to over $100 before the crash. And fast forward to 2022, the stock price was well over $2,700. Yeah. So just truly an example of how companies can innovate and grow through different market cycles. We like to say constant innovation is the new normal, which is great, right? But for new investors, that can be scary, especially if you haven't been through a recession or a downturn. And we know the cyclical natures of the market. We know yep. that there are going to be recessions and downturns. They last on average about nine months. And then they're usually followed by periods of economic expansion um, that is usually double or triple that nine months. And we just, we not just, but we came out of a period, one of the longest periods of expansion from 2009 to 2020. Um, so just, you know, as you think about your long-term strategy, you're, you're, you have to factor in time horizon. Yep. That's going to be critical. Um, you want to think about your risk tolerance as you think about how you want to get exposure to disruptive uh, tech in your investment mix. And if there's anything folks remember <laughs> from this chat, I am going to stress one more time, you can absolutely leverage active managers, totally. especially to help navigate long-term disruptive tech exposure. Well, I think, you know, just to, um, to add on to that, like you said, most people don't have the time in their day to be researching single name companies or, you know, spending every hour of every day studying AI and the impact on the economy. Like yeah. people have full-time jobs that they're working in. Yeah. And you that know, may be impacted by AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. Hopefully in a good way. Yeah, and, right. And, and, you know, you give the example of Amazon, but it's also, it's like, it's such, you know, revisionist history is so easy in the sense of like for every, for every Amazon, there were 10 pets.com. Mm -hmm. And so for someone who's not spending all of their time to try and figure out who is that next Amazon is a pretty daunting task and That's probably nice. a low probability task. And so to your point, leaning on experts, leaning on active managers, getting broad exposure to the industry is something people, you know, should probably really consider. Absolutely. Well, Lubna, it was such a good conversation with you. Thank you for being back on the show and uh, hope, you, hope to uh, have you next season as well. Yes. Thank you for having me back. This was great. <laughs> 
Thank you for tuning in to Fresh Invest today. I hope you all feel like you have a stronger understanding of the AI boom and what it could mean for your portfolio. And hopefully you feel more confident to navigate the changes that AI is inevitably bringing to the markets. It's an interesting time for AI because it's here and it's here to stay. But at the same time, many of the anticipated changes aren't quite a reality yet. And since all this comes at a time of massive economic volatility, it will be interesting to see the response and sentiment from investors as developments unfold. Thanks again for listening and join us next week when we'll continue the AI conversation by exploring how this tech is changing the investing experience. We'll talk all about AI-based investing tools and how you can leverage their capabilities. It's an interesting look at AI's role in how we invest, so stay tuned and I'll see you next episode.